Here we go. Understand the FDA guidance. Uh, the, the FDA announced in December that they would be removing all uh, growth promoting claims from all feed added antibiotics. And I'm going to try to explain what that means in the next few minutes. Um, this is the final step. I think it's important for everybody to understand. This is the final step in, in, a, in a series of events that started uh, a couple of decades ago. Uh, they decided with the, FD, with the input from the Center for Disease Control and concern about antibiotic resistance and the relationship that agriculture might play to the resistance of antibiotics as it might affect an MD's ability to treat a human, that subtherapeutic use of antibiotics uh, needed to go away. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to lose our antibiotics. Uh, so we're going to look and talk about some of those claims. To start with, as I looked at this hierarchy of what needed to change, a lot of the medications we had uh, pretty ineffective at the doses that they were labeled for. Uh, some of you remember uh, penicillin is labeled for one cc per hundred pounds of body weight. At the time, oxytetracycline was labeled for five milligrams per pound of body weight. Um, the proposal was that veterinarians be given the legal opportunity to adjust the doses that would more appropriately address the animal's disease condition until such time that the labels could be adjusted. In the case of Oxytet, it went from 5 milligrams per pound of body weight, and today the labels carry 13 milligrams per pound of body weight. Uh, at those doses, however, it's very important that you follow the label recommendations. Uh, so, for instance, 13 milligrams per pound of body weight, if given too rapidly IV, can cause the death or injury to an animal. Uh, as, as we change these doses, we've got to follow the labels. Penicillin, doses haven't changed, nor are they going to. Uh, penicillin was then and continues to be today the largest residue uh, identified from all antibiotics and other substances by the uh, Food Safety Inspection Service, uh, we may well lose penicillin. But in 1994, we got the right, the legal right to change those doses. With that came terms like extra label drug use, uh, which applies to over the counter medications such as penicillin, uh, and we could adjust those. But if we adjust them, uh, they have to be done under a prescription. So they're no longer an over-the-counter. You can buy them over-the-counter, but the use is considered a prescription. Uh, regardless of what happens, uh, the concern is that you have a residue. And if you do have a residue, it don't make any difference whether you have the legal right to use it or not, uh, adulterating food is a criminal offense. The next step on their agenda, now keep in mind this was 96, uh, uh, or 94. Uh, this issue had started uh, back in the late 80s. And our first new antibiotic came in 1988, and that was in uh, Naxil. Uh, behind that, in 1992, uh, we got uh, Mycotil. Uh, so those were the only two new antibiotics, both of which came in as prescription antibiotics. Uh, concern about cross-resistance uh, from Naxel, especially Naxel, sort of kicked uh, CDC in high gear to start an antibiotic monitoring program. Uh, Naxel is, is, is a third-generation cephalosporin, and what that means it is, is that it has enhanced activity, but it also is a, it is a very, very, very important drug in humans. So if a resistance issue showed up, it, it, it definitely uh, would be of, an, uh, of concern to the Center for Disease Control. 
they developed the National Monitoring Program, uh, and this was 1996, in part for the concern over antibiotics uh, that were not the old antibiotics as much as they were the new ones, and, and, and monitoring uh, resistance to uh, the com or the drug, it's called Ceftifur, that's in Naxel, was front of their list. And, and, and they especially are concerned about bacteria that may be transferred from animals to man through food. Uh, the most common ones of concern are E. coli, Salmonella, and Campylobacter. Uh, work between them for over a decade uh, has been to watch that trend. And that trend's been pretty stable, but it hasn't it hasn't alleviated any of their fears. In, in 2003, uh, the FSI, or food, uh, FDA, <clears throat> working with the CDC, developed this guidance for the industry 152. And, and you can see in front of you a nine, like a checkerboard that has nine squares. Now, if you look across the top, the very top row were for critical antibiotics that, you know, if we got a resistance in those, the, the doctor's ability to treat your child is really compromised. If you look at the second row, those are drugs that are very important to humans, but they're not considered critical. And the bottom row are drugs that have absolutely no influence, no relationship to humans, or any resistance issues in humans. Uh, those are medications that we would use in the feed, uh, like the ionophores, uh, such as rumensin, uh, and so forth. Uh, if you look down the columns, now start to the left, and you see less than seven days, uh, the judgment of the FDA and the Center for Disease Control is that if we used an antibiotic to treat an animal uh, and we used it for less than seven days, the bacteria, it would be such a short number of days exposed that they had not a, they didn't have a great fear that, would re, that resistance uh, would occur. Uh, it, apparently, the relationship is it takes time for this to develop in several generations of bacteria. The middle column, is 7 to 21. Now those are going to pick up some of the cattle that we have relapsed. Uh, it may pick up some of the things that we may need to use in the feed uh, for control of pneumonia since the, the respiratory disease uh, cycle in cattle is typically uh, not just a seven day period but we see it run through the first two three weeks of cattle as they enter our yards. And the last column is over 21 days. That's they, they thought anything, any exposure to the bacteria over 21 days uh, could well lead to resistance. And, and that was the most troubling one. Uh, beginning, important to know, very important to know, is that every one of those, as you look at them, like that critical antibiotic, um, there's a human drug like ciprofloxacin, which is the drug that they... Uh, uh, immediately passed out to people that were exposed to anthrax when back when the letters were being uh, sent to uh, officials on the East Coast. We have a con we have a, a drug, not the same drug, but very very similar to it, uh, and, and that that drug is Batril. So extra label drug use associated with critical antibiotics, uh, regardless of our legal status to be able to change drugs. You can't change it on those. Batril has to be used absolutely as the label uh, dictates, or in fact, if we don't continue to do our part, uh, we'll lose that drug. The, the really critical, I mean, the, the, in, the ones that are concerned, uh, they classify as important, uh, like penicillin, tetracyclines, uh, we have those counterparts in humans. Uh, the macrolids I'm talking about, we use Tylenin in humans, it's most often erythromycin, and it's most often used in teenagers. Uh, so concern for resistance is uh, going to stay under their watchful eye. Now, as you think about that 
that grid, they also made the decision when they published this grid in 2003 that there would never, ever, in the future of the FDA, be an antibiotic uh, approved for use over the counter again. So over the counter uh, injectables such as penicillin or teramycin, uh, those are now a thing of the past. And, and that decision, uh, they've held to it. So every antibiotic we've gotten since then, such as Draxin or Zactran or Zaprevo or, or uh, uh, New Floor, those have all been prescription only drugs. In addition, well, I just I just went through that. Uh, no future approvals for production purposes. We're not going to get any more drugs that have anything to do with feed efficiency, uh, improved gain, or improving reproductive efficiency, such as improving pregnancy rates in cows. Uh, to reopen that, I mean, the FDA is not trying to, honestly, uh, to the bottom of my heart, we've got some real friends. The beef industry and agriculture has some real friends in the FDA. Uh, you know, the crazy folks of the world would like to have all these antibiotics taken away. Uh, case closed, uh, we don't care. But the FDA have fought them off. I mean, the French have fought us over implants. And our, and our FDA has stood on science at every step of the way. And the science says that we have been responsible users of antibiotics and the relationship is dubious uh, between animals and, and man for some of the claims that have been made against us. So their point was, is that in the future, we will approve antibiotics, we being the FDA, only for disease uses. And the disease uses are treatment, prevention, and control. Uh, and we'll talk, you're going to hear that, those three words again several times. Uh, livestock industry was stuck, sort of in limbo. Uh, we're not going to get any new antibiotics to use in the feed. And, and not that we had bad drugs. If you think about, God, I look at the ionophores uh, it, it, it is a gift from God. They're wonderful products. Decox, Bovitec, Rumensin, you know, coccidiosis, which is a real issue in feedlots. Those are things of the past. And, and, and I'm not certain with the way we feed cattle, um, you may not get a great deal of feed efficiency out of those products, but they certainly help improve uh, control of coccidia and so forth. Uh, tetracycline, we have it. And we have it currently labeled at uh, 10 milligrams per pound of body weight for up to five days for specifically for the treatment of pneumonia, a specific disease uh, caused by pastorella pneumonia or pastorella multosta, a specific bacteria. And the same for scours. It carries a label for scours, again, a specific disease caused by E. coli, again, a specific bacteria. And you're going to hear that over and over because that's those are going to be the only conditions that the FDA will approve in the future. Specific diseases, specific targeted bacteria. And in Thailand, uh, liver abscesses are controlled. Remember, treatment, prevention, control. Controlled, in this case, by a bacteria called fusobacteria. It's the foot rot bacteria and it's present in all the, uh, every, every fecal sample in the world from a cow has fusobacteria in it. So it's a very, very common bacteria. Uh, we're not going to get any new antibiotics for use in feed uh, without some mechanism with which they can document to the public that, that they, their decision is not jeopardizing the safeguards needed to protect humans. And, and behind that we got Guide for the Industry 209. They got that in April of, of previous year. Uh, and, and it outlined the use of what they refer to as the Veterinary Feed Directive. Uh, now the Veterinary Feed Directive is not new. It's been around for a while uh, in, in swine. So there was some experience and some comfort knowing that it had been successfully used in swine. The mechanism uh, would allow for treatment, prevention, and control, very three important, important words, 
for a specific disease causing bacteria that was in a very for a targeted group of affected animals or in a group of animals that were at a high risk of developing a disease from a specific bacteria. Um, the VFD that's available for swine was, was for uh, literally mycotil, the injectable that we use in cattle, only in the feed. And instead of mycotil, it's called pulmotil. But it's tilmycosin, the active drug, is the same. Uh, now approved for cattle. Uh, Alanco, the manufacturers of pulmotil, have worked pretty hard uh, to make sure that the network of people who can distribute that drug uh, have all the access to that medication that's needed uh, to be delivered when it's needed, where it's needed, and on time. Um, the, VF, the paperwork that goes with the BFD, VFD or Veterinary Feed Directive is absolutely a pain. Uh, and, and they've worked, they, they, they've revised it a couple of times since they started to make it uh, make more sense, uh, kind of become a one-page deal, a piece of paperwork instead of a multiple-page piece of paperwork, um, if you will, streamlined that, that process. And Alanco, there's a company called Global VetLink, Free Enterprise, stepped in and said, uh, we can make this easier. Uh, FDA's calculations will be uh, more reliable, um, and we can move the forms to all the people that the FDA required. Uh, a, a copy of the form to the producer, the veterinarian, uh, the feed mill, and, and a copy on file for the FDA should they need it. Uh, that service is currently underwritten by Alanco, and your veterinarian, uh, working with them to identify disease, uh, be a pretty easy step to move over. Uh, Let's see. <laughs> Lots of folks have been pretty enthusiastic about identifying this, and I'm talking companies. Companies like Zoetis, uh, who currently, at any rate, a number of companies are enthused about this that don't have a product, but it opens the door uh, for potential new products to enter the market that we've never had. Uh, companies, from, from the date of this 213 announcement, have three years to voluntarily pull the labels or change their labels to get a production purpose um, wording off. Remove the feed efficiency claims and remove uh, the, the, the average daily gain claims. Um, they can resubmit those. Now, I don't mean the FDA is not asking them to resubmit all the research. Just ask that the labels be changed and that if they have a disease prevention, treatment, or control uh, option for the use of that drug, that the wording be changed to match a specific disease and a specific bacteria causing that disease. Uh, let's think about what we're giving up. Well, I don't think we're giving up anything, nor does Honestly, nor do the cattlemen's uh, predating uh, even the document 152, which was in 2003. Back in 2001, the Scientific Advisory Committee for the NCBA uh, convinced the NCBA that in cattle production, uh, we don't rely on those claims. Uh, we use uh, ionophores to control uh, intake. Coccidia, we're not we're not reaching up and trying to get a ton of performance out of those. We use uh, Thailand specifically to control a disease uh, called liver abscesses uh, in a targeted group of animals, and those are animals that are on high energy feeds to be then at a high risk of developing one or higher risk of developing one. So the wording, production use. Uh, the Scientific Advisory Committee suggested to the NCBA to take that off. Uh, so since 2001, uh, under the prudent use guidelines from the NCBA, they have added item number, the last item on the list, 
is subtherapeutic antibiotic use is discouraged. Uh, antibiotics should be limited to prevention, control of disease, and should not be used if the principal intent is to improve performance. Uh, and, and, and that's a pretty neat deal. Uh, we, we've, we've been under scrutiny, livestock industry has been under scrutiny about how we use antibiotics. And a couple, and a few years ago, uh, that became an international issue. And when our cattlemen produced the document that said, uh, you, you know, we don't do that. We don't encourage sub-therapeutic use. Uh, we use antibiotics for a purpose, and it is for the health and well-being of our animals. Uh, for the most part, it completely disarmed all the naysayers, uh, both in this country uh, and especially those in Europe, who wanted to toss rocks. Uh, let's take a look briefly at what the new label is going to look like. Uh, this is a label that I put together that represents uh, uh, what a generic uh, CTC or chlortetracycline 100 uh, grams per pound product currently looks like. And I've left off all the stuff about pigs and poultry and so forth and just included the stuff about cattle. Uh, and under calves, I have in gray highlighted some areas uh, and that, that wording is going to disappear. Um, and as are those doses for that, that apply to that wording. Increased rates of body weight gain and, and improved feed efficiency. That dose is not going to be on the future labels, uh, nor will that wording. Uh, in its stead, places like, uh, in this case, uh, growing cattle over 400 pounds, 70 milligrams per head per day, uh, that dose can be used to reduce liver condemnations due to liver abscesses. But liver abscesses are not um, a specific enough uh, requirement. You remember, they now require that we have a specific disease, of which liver abscesses is, caused by a specific bacteria so the name of the bacteria associated with that disease will be added to the label, as I have in that bottom red box, uh, associated with Fusobacteria uh, uh, necroporum uh, and others. Now here's the bottom line. I think the downside is a bunch of paperwork that I don't look forward to. Uh, I'm really glad to be standing by my nutritionist uh, uh, buddies uh, I'm a vet, they're a nut, and I, I think the two of us uh, working together can do a, a much better job of, of, of orchestrating how we move these products into uh, your cattle that, that need them, such as Pulmatel. Uh, if you've got cattle that uh, and require that drug, uh, work with nutritionists to make sure that we don't... Uh, get in Dutch over the combinations that we use and that drug can be used uh, in combination with uh, I, I think the Ionophores so that's not going to change that um, but it's going to be a partnership um, in, in this global vet link uh, internet ability to deal with it also says that we're probably not going to we're not going to need to be in the same room when it happens so when a set of calves that need uh, a particular drug in this case, we have one Pullmantel. Uh, that that can be done in, in communication with the uh, the nutritionist to orchestrate how we do this. Uh, will be improved uh, to be ab able to access everything on their on their smartphone that they're carrying. Um, I think a decade from now, when everybody looks back, if in fact this process works and we have less resistant bacteria. Uh, cattlemen have always done the responsible thing and we're going to be really glad that we helped. Uh, if in fact there is no change in resistance, uh, the world's going to know that we weren't the big problem they thought we were. Uh, the, the, the big upside for us is that it opens the door for us to get some antibiotics for use 
to help cattle in a time of health need, such as pneumonia or other disease, that we've never had before. And we're not going to get them unless this change were made. Uh, <laughs> as strange as it may sound, we, we may see new floor in the feed. We may see uh, Draxon in the feed. Uh, I, I look forward, and it's going to take three years before we know that anything's going to change, and that's when all the labels are in. But you give another five or seven years, five or seven years after that, uh, we, we may have it better than we ever thought. Uh, so it could be, at least from my position, my point of view, a real win-win. Uh, I, I think I've covered everything, and I'll be happy to take any questions.